Hayao Miyazaki's Kiki's Delivery Service is a classic coming of age tale of a little witch girl going off to make her own living in a foreign town. Nah, but we're not here to talk about that good movie. We're here to talk about the 2014 live action adaptation that is also an adaptation of the same book. It's not very good, as we'll get into later, but first I have to question this movie's very existence. Who thought this was a good idea? Did they seriously think they could outdo Miyazaki, arguably Japan's greatest anime director? This was never going to be something people were going to watch over the original, which hasn't aged a day by the way. That movie will stand the test of time because of its gorgeous style animation, but this movie? It already looks dated. In fact, this looked dated the second it was released into theatres. But let's jump straight into this movie and see where it goes wrong. <laughs> The film opens in a very similar fashion to the original movie, except it's much longer, drawn out and considerably less interesting. Hey, remember that incredibly cute scene from the original movie where Kiki's dad picked her up to say goodbye? Well, this movie does the same thing, only it's much weirder since Kiki is played by a 16 year old girl. No joke. Actress Fuka Kashiba here is 16 years old. <laughs> This is the first time I think I've said this about a Japanese actress, but she looks a little too old for the part. Hey, is that racist? Is that racist? Maybe they wanted to avoid that style of acting you get in Gamera movies. Johnny, don't go, it's too dangerous. I don't care. Her talking cat Gigi is rendered with terrible CGI, by the way. Because apparently getting a real cat to do cat stuff is just way too hard. It's too... It's too much money. So Kiki sets off on her year-long journey to find a town away from other witches. Wait, what, what what's going on? Why are we flashing back to when she was home? We already sat through 10 minutes of this and it was boring the first time. So basically what we have here is Kiki's mother telling her about witch tradition, but she doesn't want to abide by tradition, and... And they also tell us that she has to go on an apprenticeship, which is something we already established in the opening. It's a pointless scene that doesn't really go anywhere, and then hippos! Adorable, cute, cuddly baby hippos, also rendered in terrible B-movie CGI. But at least they have an excuse for this one. No baby hippo this cute exists in nature. So the townspeople are a little bit more hostile to witches in this version, suggesting that she put a curse on the animals and what have you. Yeah, I know I keep comparing this to the original movie, even though it's based on the book, but it's hard not to, alright. This was probably cashing in on the success of the animated movie anyway, so... It's fair game in my eyes. <laughs> So you might be wondering where this movie is actually set. The original kept this vague, but it had an unmistakably European vibe to its town. This movie does try and do the same thing, particularly with the windmill at the bakery. But they aren't fooling anyone, this is Japan through and through. So Kiki meets up with Asono at the bakery and immediately comes up with the idea of setting up her own flying delivery service. It's not very successful though, probably because nobody knows it exists. I mean, outside of the bakery, who else knows about it? I've got about a thousand pounds of uh, cocaine. Just figured you guys would run it up there. Her first customer is wannabe flyboy Tombo, but this makes Kiki mad because he only made her do it to see how fast she could fly. Even though he does offer to pay her anyway, so I don't see what the big deal is. Beggars can't be choosers, Kiki. And then some lady at the dry cleaners asks her to fix her washing machine, but Kiki tells her to get an electrician to do it. Snicky, do you know the difference between a washing machine and a dryer? Get it right, you fucking muppet. Uh, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that, and I doubt your claim of its existence, Senzu. So witches can't fix things with magic. What do witches do in this universe other than fly around and go on apprenticeships? Wow, these special effects, man. They they are they are not good. They. They, they are not good at all. If this is exactly what you imagined when you heard there was going to be a live action Kiki's delivery service, you are a very cynical person. It stinks! So having been somewhat useful while using her flight to dry clothes, Kiki is now loved by the townspeople. They are very easily won over it seems. <laughs> A lot of this movie is just Kiki doing stuff. She gets her broom stolen, she delivers something to an ex-singer that Asuno's husband likes, and here's her sob story. It's all very mundane. So Kiki is befriended by this girl and is asked to deliver a letter to someone. But it turns out this is a trick to scare a group of girls she doesn't like by telling them that a witch is going to put a curse on them. And Kiki is totally fine with this, for some reason. She got mad at Tombo for his victimless scheme, but telling lies that Kiki is handing down curses in the form of letters is 
totes okay. Let's be BFF now, yay! By the way, Gigi is still in this movie. I felt I needed to reiterate this because he is such a non-presence in this film. He's there and he says things every now and then, but you forget he's even in the movie half the time. This really could have used a Phil Hartman is what I'm saying. Don't touch my stuff! Hey, this isn't the YMCA. So everyone in the town returns their deliveries to Kiki because uh, I guess they still think she's evil or something. Blame this girl! And then Kiki goes off into a rage and loses her power of flight. Meanwhile, Tombo almost dies in his flying machine and we get a flashback to the god damn house again. Kiki is unsure of herself and this leads to a lull in the film where not much of anything is happening really. Tombo teaches Kiki how to ride a bike in one of the few pretty decent scenes in this movie. Kiki finds joy not being able to fly, while Tombo has a sad realisation that he'll never be able to fly. It's a nice little scene, but it's unfortunately followed by the stupidest part of the movie. Kiki is called to the zoo for an important delivery. She must transport the adorable hippopotamus to Dr. Ishii on another island in dangerous winds for unspecified reasons. Meanwhile, this guy is being every annoyed Japanese man in every Japanese movie ever. Huh? And now she can talk to animals. I guess that makes sense, being a witch and all. <laughs> Witches can only talk to bad CGI animals though, not real ones. So having such an important job on her shoulders, Kiki finds the magic within her to once again fly. I don't want to be mean here, but is it really worth risking the lives of two young, albeit 16 year old children, for a hippopotamus? The singer from earlier in the movie even had a witch friend that died in heavy winds, so this movie wants us to know that this is dangerous stuff. I mean, what is even wrong with a hippo? Is it dying? Unless it's about to explode and take the entire island with it, it's not a good enough reason. So anyway, the single lady starts singing again and guides him to the island, completing her character arc that I've barely even mentioned up until this point. I guess her voice just carries really far. I mean, a lighthouse would have been more effective, but... <sighs> Meh... Wh wh whatever's... whatever's this, uh... Uh, this'll do. Sing, singer's voice. Yeah, sure, why not? That's good enough. They make it safely to Dr. Ishii and we find out what's wrong with the hippo. Really? Really? That's the reason? That, that, is that the reason, is it? They couldn't have waited a day or two for the storm to clear. We had to send two children to their possible deaths so this kawaii hippo can be one with its body and soul again. Kiki and Tombo don't even question this, by the way. This, this makes... This makes perfect sense to them. Perfect sense. And this was the climax of the movie, by the way. That exciting, crashing dirigible sequence from Miyazaki's version, replaced by this incoherent hippo rescue sequence that is not even exciting in the least. Only a couple hours later, the weather clears up and they fly home fine. Kiki is accepted as a hero by the townspeople. Something that makes sense when you save a kid from a falling airship in front of everyone. Not so much when you restore a hippo's sense of self. I know if someone told me this happened at a local zoo, I'd just shrug my shoulders and say, well that's stupid and irresponsible, and completely forget about it. I would not sing their praises, that's for sure. So that's the 2014 Kiki's Delivery Service movie. Earlier I said most of the movie is just Kiki doing stuff. Well, I could probably say the same thing about Miyazaki's version, honestly. But that version had the benefit of some truly mesmerising animation, and that sense of magic that only Studio Ghibli is able to convey. This version is just kind of a dead sit. It's not exciting, it's not that interesting, and the pacing isn't very good. This is an hour and 50 minutes, and you feel every single one of those minutes. This could have easily been cut down to a solid 90 minutes at the very least. It doesn't transcend its demographic like Miyazaki's masterpiece does. It stays firmly in its demographic and I would be seriously surprised if this appealed to anyone over the age of 8. The acting is passable but everything else is so bland and uninteresting. There's something missing in Kiki's characterization here that makes her less compelling. And its climax is just unwatchably bad. We've seen this story done a lot better. We've seen this done a lot smarter by a much better filmmaker. This movie has no reason to exist. Don't watch it. Not even out of curiosity. 
And where is Kiki's red bow? Come on, she has to have the red bow! This has been me, Snickety, and now I'm gonna go and watch some better movies. I'll see you later. Bye. Magenta, you been this? It's happening! I can't believe it, but we're locked into it. 50 minutes and counting. Christ, they're just can't take it. I can't fucking take it. We shoot our wad in 50 minutes. They're gonna pick us up in five or ten, and you can get it back in an hour and ten, maybe 75 minutes. I I'm talking about nuclear fucking war.